places, worn out places, worn out faces. Hide my head, I want to drown my sorrow. No tomorrow, no tomorrow. And I find it kind of funny, I find it kind of sad. The dreams in which I'm dying are the best I've ever had. I find it hard to tell you, I find it hard to take. When people run in circles, it's a very, very mad world. Hello, I'm a PC, and I've been made into a stereotype. I'm a PC, and I'm not what you call hip. I'm a PC, and I wear glasses. I wear glasses. Hey, I Glasses. I wear jeans. And I study jeans. And I design jeans. And I design green buildings. I'm a PC and I study the law. And I practice the law. And I challenge the law. I'm a PC and I blog for Obama. And I broadcast for McCain. And I have a beard. I'm a PC and I have three rings. I'm a PC and I have one ring. I turn number two into energy. I'm a PC and I want to protect these. I'm a PC and I'm connected to more than a billion others worldwide. Roger that, Houston. I'm a PC. And my name is Roger. I'm a PC. I'm a PC. I'm a PC. Yeah, I'm a PC too. I'm a PC and a human being. Not a human doing, not a human thinking, a human being. I'm a PC and I sell fish. We started with a sensor that turned voice and movement into magic. Xbox, play. And we thought, this will be fun to play with. And it was. But something amazing is happening. The world is starting to imagine things we hadn't even thought of. Unexpected things. Helpful things. Beautiful things. Inspired things. Which is why, even though the world keeps asking us what we'll do with Connect next, we're just as excited to ask the world the same thing. delighted we could share in the serenity and joy of this beautiful day as we come together to celebrate the commitment Excuse me. of these Would two. Would you mind moving your enormous phone? You mean the enormously awesome galaxy? Search one trick pony. Aren't you a little young to have an iPhone? You want to go? I sheep, copy bots. Auto correct this. <laughs> Search karate! Karate! You think if they knew about the Nokia Lumia, they'd stop fighting all the time? I don't know. I think they kind of like fighting. The Windows Phone Nokia Lumia 920. And Gadget's Reader's Choice Smartphone of the Year. Sorry, I don't update like that. I'm sorry, I can only do one thing at a time. I guess PowerPoint isn't one of those things. Should we just play chopsticks? What is technology? What can it do? When I lost my eyesight, I thought that my painting days were over. How far can we go? 
By using your hands, you can actually control your x-ray. Technology has the power to unite us. Hang on, honey. Hang on. There he is. Can you see him? I can see him. It inspires us. Technology has taken us places we've only dreamed. Now I can do whatever I want. It gives hope to the hopeless. Can you hear me talking? <laughs> and it has given voice to the voiceless. If you think about it, science is like everything. It can really help you uncover like little, small, little secrets. I built a garage door opener, and I'm working on my own website. I built a computer, and I opened a fridge with a Lego. When I was littler, I used to think technology was great. And then I started thinking that it was more of a boy's thing. I used to think that Inventing is like for boys because they have Albert Einstein invented, he was a guy, and Benjamin Franklin also. There used to be a girl in the robotics class, but she quit, and so I'm the only girl left. Oh, you can't like science. You're a girl. You can't like any of these science things. In commercials, I saw a lot more men doing it. They might really love science, but they might be like afraid people might think, oh, don't boys do that? That's a boy thing. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Dear Gabrielle, dear Anya, keep opening those garage doors. We think you'll create something great for us one day. I might someday, but not yet, because I'm pretty much not old enough, but soon. It's just really cool that I would write a letter. It's, it's just, it's cool. Hello everyone, thank you for coming out. And uh, thank you to our panelists today. I'm Debbie Greiner with Adweek, and uh, we're going to dive in, because I think uh, Rob wanted to show another 17 ads in a little bit. I so. did not. <laughs> um, the one show curation. <laughs> Uh, I want These to chairs are awesome. Oh my God. Yeah. How's everybody doing today? <laughs> Thanks for coming out. I'm going to lean forward just so I don't Look. accidentally just slide I feel like, right Yeah, out. I feel like, woo. It, it is nice. It's like this candle. <laughs> Uh, one thing I wanted to kind of start the conversation with is just talking about how the brand has changed since you each uh, were first exposed to it, not as users necessarily, but as professionals. Uh, Kathleen, if you want to start out about where it was when you first arrived, and then I'd like to hear from your early agency experiences from both Andy and Rob, too. Um, when I first started Microsoft, it was post Vista. Great. And I was one of a group of sort of consumer marketing people that were brought in to try and change the way Microsoft approaches marketing. And I'll never forget what the headhunter said to me. He said, look, you should do it. Because you know, if you succeed, you're a hero. And if you fail, it's my freaking Microsoft. No one's going to ever blame you. <laughs> so it was kind of like a, a, a no one thing. But what I was really interested in and what really appealed to me is the potential of the brand. And um, it was in a really, really tough spot. But we had hoped, working closely with Crispin at the time, that we were just you know, a rock group that put out one really bad album, but we could come back from it. And that was one of the things we kept saying was our attitude. And we knew there was a lot of ground level work that had to be done, like who are we and what do we stand for? But internally, people were beaten down because the I'm a Mac, I'm a PC campaign not only was one of the greatest campaigns, I think, in some of advertising history, um, you know, people started to believe it. They started to feel like they were not good enough and Apple was better and we just couldn't win. And I think you know, job one was really convincing people, if we look at what our equity is, which was phenomenal, again, working with the agency, we were democratic and inclusive and colorful and for the people and of the people. And you know, we, we empower people to do great things. It's not about the device. It's what you do with it. Like, all that richness of the brand was phenomenal. So we knew we just had to kind of dig into it, uncover it, make people internally start to believe in it, and then bring it to life creatively. And that's really where the brand was. Were you confident in the brand's uh, ability to be a device maker on the level, you know, facing such incredible competition from Apple and from uh, emerging players at that time and going from being a software company to being a device company? How confident were you in Microsoft's ability to make that 
evolution. And Pretty confident, because we knew, obviously, way before the world did what was going on. I, I don't think there are smarter people on the face of the earth than are walking around Microsoft. So um, you know, the challenge was really getting them aligned and focused on what the desired outcome was. It's not just about what you build, it's who you're building it for and what they're going to do with it. Because being super smart and super great doesn't necessarily mean you're aligned with what people need and want. And I think what we added to the party, I, I add a lot of what the agency did, was helping the internal constituents understand the mindset and the needs of the customer and build to that versus sometimes build for ourselves. Uh, Andy, when you uh, were first exposed to the brand, um, can you talk about where you were? I believe you were in San Francisco at the time at McCain. Well, I, yeah, actually, I, was, I, I had been at Goodby for a few years, and some of my friends had gone over to uh, McCann to start working on Microsoft, and they, they kind of said, come on over, the water's fine. You know, we can do this. And uh, they, uh, what had happened was is Wyden had had it before. And so now uh, McCann had started doing some things, and uh, it was starting to coalesce. So I came over and the exact same thing. I'm like, I can't fail because Wyden just didn't really quite nail it. So the worst I can do is not nail it either. But maybe I will. And, and that was the hope that we all had. And so we went into it. Uh, and it was, it was a lot of hard work. The products weren't really that great yet. You know, There were some things that were starting to happen. But I think the most interesting thing that we were able to do is to start to uncover the DNA of what we believed uh, Microsoft was standing for, start to articulate that outward. Because we started realizing that these were incredibly passionate people. Every time we went up to Seattle, even though some of their products weren't necessarily like, like you know, nailing it and stuff, they wanted it so badly and you can just see it. It, is like it was infectious. And so we took that back with us and started trying to put that into the work. Um, and uh, we ended up doing a ton of work uh, really quickly for all the, all the different, uh, different avenues that, we're, that we were doing. Um, but it was, you know, it was, it was definitely hard. Uh, it's very different today. Uh, but at, back then, uh, Apple hadn't started attacking yet. It w they were the leader. You know, they weren't acting. It wasn't. There was. They weren't really acting yet. Like they were on their heels. Um, and it was, uh, you know, it was, it, was a, it was a good time. At the same time, it was interesting to start to realize that there was a lot more into Microsoft that I ever imagined. Because coming from, you know, the, our industry, we're all Mac people, right? And so all of a sudden to walk in and to start to say, now start using Microsoft products, it's, uh, I, I, I equate it to like you're a guitarist and then they tell you to learn a piano. It's not that a piano sucks, that's beautiful. You just don't know how to do it. So it's kind of convince all the people around us to say, let's all go learn the piano. Now let's all learn how to create with Microsoft. So that's, that's how we did it. And you're, you're now the uh, global ECD, I believe, for M United is your title. Is, uh, is yes. that right? Get, yes. Make sure I get the letters. Yay. Um, and Google tells me M United is a soccer team, so uh, you're, you got that. really solid search results on that. Pretty but good soccer team. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, so good job there. But tell me Thank a little you. bit about your, um, about how it felt to come back to the brand and where, where it had kind of jumped forward in the years between. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, you know, for me, I had a 12-year gap where I was not involved, but it's not like I never stopped watching it. And then when... Uh, when Crispin had it and all the, and when Rob started working on it, all of a sudden, uh, that's when I started realizing that, you know, the, the incredible campaign that really put them back again, in my opinion, was the, was the I'm a PC, where all of a sudden you're like, yeah, I'm not a Mac, I'm actually a PC. And um, that felt really great. So when, it was about a year and a half ago, we got the call to say, hey, let's, let's pitch this thing. Um, it was, uh, I, uh, the more I dug into it, uh, there was a new CEO coming in. He, he just, I think he had started. I think he was about to start. Um, there was all this really interesting buzz, and I was just thinking, my God, this is like the best time. How lucky are we to get to start to try to work on this piece of business right now in history where there's more momentum than I've ever seen mm -hmm. on, on most tech companies, let alone Microsoft. So it was a, it was a really great time to jump in. So speaking of good times to jump in, Rob, getting in with Crispin Great segue. Like and uh, <laughs> you know, being at Crispin when, uh, when you know, Microsoft finally made that comeback and finally proved itself uh, able to be cool again, uh, what was that process like and what, what's, what situation was the brand in when, when you first began dealing with it there? Well, um, first, first of all, when the opportunity came, you can imagine, I think every agency at the time product wasn't great uh, or had problems, Vista had problems. And it wasn't seen as a super cool brand, but that wasn't really what we were necessarily afraid of. I think we were afraid of 
what the people are going to be like. And I think Microsoft were afraid that Crispin was going to be a bunch of assholes. And uh, so we just sort of went for it and said, let's go have a meeting with them. And he kind of realized, like, hey, these people are actually really smart and cool and fun and normal and not like crazy Seattle death, you know, Darth Vader kind of uh, Death Star company that everybody had sort of you know, portrayed them as. And I think they saw that Crispin as an agency was very collaborative and hopefully nice people and uh, wanted to really generally help them get their mojo back. And um, so then once you get past that, it's like, okay, this could actually be good. And then you get excited about it and then you realize, wow, the product isn't very good. So the thing, the reason we ended up at the Yama PC campaign was we needed to talk about something that wasn't the operating system. So you end up having to talk about the users. And Apple had done such a good job at portraying the PC folks as sort of nerds and, you know, whether back uh, engineers or accountants, but not necessarily doing things that were beyond sort of the productive sort of people in, in the back of the office. So um, that combined with the fact that the AMA PC campaign that Apple had done was so good, but by the 10th year, they were you know, running out of things to talk about. So it started to get a little negative. And if you watch it, and you watch it in succession, it's probably, I think, maybe the top three campaigns of all time. By the end, you know, the, the Mac guy started getting nasty. So it was this moment in time where we finally were able to convince Microsoft at the time, and, and Kathleen was a part of it, we said, maybe now's the time to sort of push back. But instead of being aggressive and antagonistic, how do we hug them to death? And why don't we just say, we're, this is who we are, and, and, and see if the, the billions of people that were PCs actually would join sort of the, the, the hug to death of Apple. And it ended up, listen, I think the campaign just ended, the Apple campaign ended because when it was at, you know, at the end of the run. Um, but I like to think we helped put them there. Help kill it. Well, you, you also, it certainly hasn't hurt the Apple stock, though. You also <laughs> ruined uh, what we've all talked about, the recurring trend here, is what's the worst that can happen if you go work for Microsoft, because everything's kind of been crappy up till now. So then everyone's kind of talked about that it was so easy to come in. You've kind of ruined that by actually making uh, the advertising good. Kathleen, good job. You're Thank you. Obviously, central <laughs> good partners. But how has that challenge changed? Now, uh, when you go to create a new creative, uh, and I'm curious from both of you, uh, is it much harder now because you're building on stuff that's actually really popular and successful advertising? So everything can get better. I mean, I think that's why we're all here. That's why everybody's sitting in the audience. Like, if we think we've hit the pinnacle of doing the work, then you know, we should all leave today. So I, I don't know. I, we wake up every day thinking, how do we get better, be more uh, interesting, and break more breakthrough, and more inspiring to people? And the challenges change. I mean, that's the beauty of technology yeah. as a category. Every, every day is different. Someone introduced something. Someone discovered something. You know, something got better that, you know, technology every day is different. So we evolve to those challenges constantly. So it's not like you're kind of, we set our sights, we nailed it, it's great, stop. It's like, oh no, now this. Oh, now we have a device. Now we have new devices. Now we've got multiple. It's always something new, so. This is one of the few crowds that would appreciate a discussion as nerdy as we're about to get here, but uh, <laughs> I am really curious about agency relationships. Uh, we think about this a lot at the magazine is, uh, and I think, this happens in these cycles where brands, and right now, most brand, uh, many brands are splitting, they're breaking up their AORs, they're splitting out their work among 10, 15 different shops. N not huge companies either, like on the Microsoft level or the Google level, but um, basically saying, oh, it's much more affordable and we get niche talent and we can send it out to all these different groups. Uh, Microsoft seems to be going the other way, putting more faith in McCann, putting, uh, consolidating more of that creative work. Um, and I'm curious, what do you see as the strengths of that at a time when so many other brands seem to be saying, well, we did a review and we came out of it and we're going to give it to these seven agencies instead of one? Um, I think that there's a, a degree of complexity in a global brand, especially a global technology brand, that's really high. When you think of, you know, when we release a product, it's 23 languages, 16 ethnicities, 47 markets. Like, there's a lot of complexity in that system. So to have a distributed agency model plus that just adds like matrix over matrix. So we realized pretty quickly, um, you know, a centralized kind of vision and ownership, but with the scale that could execute in that complexity is really what we needed. And that's why we kind of shifted to more consolidation. But it's, you know, the people are key and the capability is key. I, I do not want to sacrifice creative quality for consolidation. I want great creative that I can do at big scale. And that's a tough thing to accomplish. Do you feel that with McCann, with M United, that you have that kind of dream of being able to pick up the phone and, and contact one person instead of 14 different agencies, get them in the room, yell at them to collaborate better? Do you feel like with this relationship you have? Oh, she picks up the phone. Yeah, 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 she picks up the phone. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a one-stop one, one shopping. Yeah. 
And the time difference makes for great yeah, conversations. Where are you? What are you drinking? Can I have a conversation with you now? No, it's, look, I think fundamentally, if you said to me, what makes for great work? It's a trustful relationship between the client side and the creative side. I don't agree all the time. I don't want to agree. If I, could, if I would agree with everything these guys said, then I could do the creative. I want them to constantly challenge us with external, but I, I value their capability so much. I'm going to listen to it. I'm always going to listen to it. And that's, you know, I think Rob and I and, and Andy recently, you know, the relationship is so, so strong that it makes for great, great outcome. Now, in fairness uh, to you, Microsoft has uh, some agency partners who are also doing excellent work with some of the, uh, you know, kind of, I don't know what you call it, outer brands, but like Skype and the, the work that uh, yep. Prayer and Odell's done on that. And I'm curious, maybe this is a good question for Rob, is just how do you, um, how do you respect and keep up a communication across agencies with their, their with these remaining agency partners from Microsoft uh, and keep it from getting, you know, combative and all the Yeah, I, I, I don't think it gets combative. I mean, we're all, I mean, the business has changed, I think, than maybe when Andy and I were slightly younger. Like, I think we all root for each other. I mean, I'm, I'm friends with PJ and um, you know, Jamie, who did a lot of the work for Skype. Like, the more agencies doing great work for any kind of Microsoft brand helps us all. So I don't know, it's pretty easy. We don't really cross pollinate on these things quite yet, um, but we certainly root for each other, hopefully to do great work. Um, I think there's enough positivity within the Microsoft ecosystem that everybody sees that, hey, if we all work together, it will be uh, good in the end. Uh, one thing we've touched on a little bit, but I'm sure it is always a fun topic to discuss, is, is the way that competitors and competition is handled in advertising. Uh, you know, in the, in the 80s, it was always the blank, you know, leading product, and now it's much more head-on. Uh, you guys have, as we saw with uh, some of the spots, that you've found ways to uh, really mention and discuss those competitors directly without necessarily wading into the fray. I'm just curious how you find that balance of acknowledging consumer choice, acknowledging that this is a highly competitive marketplace, but coming out of it without looking like your caddy and... It's a, it's a really fine balance. It was absolutely necessary though, because I think one of the things we all recognized fairly early on as we started to recover post Vista is we are a challenger brand but we're painted as this big Darth Vader behemoth, and we need to change that perception. So we said, you know what? We're gonna start acting like a challenger brand, and challengers would go right out these guys and say, you know what? They're great at this, we're great at that, and we're cheaper, you know? So it, 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 there was like a sort of confidence shift and a mindset shift that went from sort of defensive, retreative kind of to confident, and the way we, we drew the line was really being clear on the brand personality, never being catty. And it was never putting down a Mac user. It was always fact-based and comparative. And that, you know, the, the humor we always talk about is a wink. There's a, there's a wink. It's not a ho, ho, ho. It's not a trying to punch them. But it's just like, you know, the little chopsticks at the end. It's not mean. It's just kind of funny. Yeah, I think there's definitely something in like respecting your competitor and saying that's cool, but we do this and maybe we do this better versus, you know, you know, trying to tell them that they're not as good. It's just like, no, you're great. And if that's what you're into, that's great. However, we have this option and this option actually has some really, really cool things you should know about. And delivering that tone over and over and over again, you, you, you get across that challenger uh, mentality, but you showing that respect and all of a sudden I think it's hard not to like that. It's hard not to... To, to say, well, I don't like you for, for saying that. He's like, no, you're, it sounds like you're being pretty honest. I also think, you know, trying not to be cool. One thing I, I've, I've worked on in about 10 years, and there's been different people, and, and maybe even before Kathleen, who the word cool, how do we be cool? And then when Kathleen came in and said, listen, what we do is cool. We don't have to try to be cool. Every time we try to be cool, we ended up falling on our faces. So I, I think that was a big part of and Kathleen joined, was like, let's just be ourselves, tell our story, don't try to be catty, don't try to be cool, just you'll be cool by the things. And now the products are actually as cool as... Uh, yeah, a big word that we use a lot is humble. Like Microsoft <coughs> automatically would get categorized as being you know, arrogant. So we said, check that, this is up. 
we're confident, but we're humble. And it's really reflective of the personalities of the company. You look at Bill Gates, he's not, he's not an asshole. Like he's not like, I'm so great and I'm so smart. And, and the super smart people that are in the company aren't like that either. So we decided the brand needs to reflect the personality of the company and we can have humility in our confidence and we can have humor in our humility. And that, I think being super clear on that brand identification and personality helps us do creative. Because you know, Rob will say, give me, give me those narrow parameters of what we are, what we stand for, and what we need to say. I'll knock it out of the ballpark creatively. Not that he's that hard, but he does. Yeah. Because it helps, it helps having those parameters. That's your epic humility. I guess. I will crush this. <laughs> <it. laughs> I will crush this right down the middle. <laughs> um, and it, I feel like in addition to TV spots and video spots, the new battleground for this competitiveness day to day is in real time and social content. Um, and there is a lot of debate right now in the industry about whether you take those easy shots. When your competitor uh, stumbles through either a PR error or through a product error, uh, what is your kind of uh, vision and mission that, that you've given to Microsoft and to the agencies about how, how to manage that balance in, no. in social? That's, we, social as a tool is a separate conversation. Do we take shots at competitors who stumble? Never. Because you know what? There but for the grace of God, go away. Everybody's going to make a mistake. We don't do, and that, that's what I mean about the brand personality. It, it's, it's not gratuitous negativity. Mm. We, don't, we don't celebrate their, their failures. That's not a place the brand would go. And I think the people who work on the business know that. Well, it's not that we don't come up with something anyway, I didn't show you. Yeah. <laughs> but then we know we can't do it, and it's, it's not the right thing to yeah. do. How has, while we're on the topic of social and real-time content, responsive content, how has that changed the kind of the day-to-day -day reality of creative planning? Um, and uh, I don't know, Andy, if you might want to start here, or just the, uh, that it's not just about creating a campaign and then launching it, but you're actually watching day-to-day -day for more yeah. new content. Well, it's layered now. Before, it was you knew that you had a certain amount of media buy, and you knew you were going to do television, and, that, and you might you could build a million and one microsites that were useless. Now, it's very much about, you know, you know you're going to have, you know there are going to be product launches, and, there's, there, and that's going to happen. Um, but at the same time, you have to always maintain this uh, ability to be culturally relevant and be looking to see where you can insert yourself and deliver a really great message that might push your product, but might also just push the brand. So it's happening simultaneously. And the important thing and that what, we're, what we've been doing is setting ourselves up to be able to um, sustain that so that we actually we systemize it so that we are actively, constantly as a group, looking for where can we insert ourselves, where can we put in Microsoft, what's happening uh, uh, and, and that's culturally relevant. And um, Kathleen loves dime, uh, uh, triangles. <laughs> so one of the triangles that we had to memorize was this idea of product truth, consumer truth, um, and then uh, cultural truth. Culture, Culture truth. truth. Which I so I don't know how the hell I remember <laughs> that. This is how we do it, though, because then you go, okay, uh, what the cultural truth is basically what's the currency, what is happening right now, what, what's going on, where is it happening in the, in the world? It's a global brand. You can't just be myopic and think about what's happening, like in New York. It has to be what's happening where. And then you think about, well, now how does that affect uh, people? Is there is there a human insight to that cultural trend that's happening? And then finally, what does Microsoft have, either as a brand that they stand for or a product that actually links up that we can connect the dots? and do it really quickly. So that's constantly happening. That's in the background. Yeah, we've actually, you know, as it relates to the model, we've talked about what's the right way to kind of organize the creative group. And the analogy we used recently is, we want a writer's room mentality. We're a sitcom, we're running a show. And every Monday, sit down and throw out ideas. Here's what's happened, here's what competitors did, here's what was in the press, and just come up with ideas. And things like the girls do science thing, no plan. It was maybe 10 days in the making, we said, hey, International Women's Day is coming up, and we have an issue in this industry about not enough women in technology, and the more we dug into the issue, we realized it's because not enough girls stay in science, and boom, done. Or the Siri spot, um, where Siri, you know, they basically come out with a new iPhone. It's big, it's big, it's big. And so these guys came up with a spot overnight that, you know, Cortana talks to Siri and say, oh, hi, Siri, how you doing? You know, you've been around for the holidays. I'm just bigger, I'm just bigger. Oh, don't worry, it happens to everybody these days. <laughs> like, just a cute idea. So it's not this, like, let's send a brief. Boom, tennis match. Let's hit back our interpretation of the brief. Boom, back in your court. Here's first round drafts, okay. Here's, that's not the way we need to work together, I don't think, to be great. You need to get into a room and have the creatives in a room and just be thinking topically about the brand, the products, what's going on, and have it be dynamic. That's but that's a new a shift. That's a big shift from how Microsoft was in the, in the yeah. past, and I think that's 
why you get things like the girls' signs, which I, which I, I don't have kids, and uh, but still is a very emotional. But you know, girls. Thought. I know I have nieces, and uh, <laughs> you know, I think it was a really timely thing that that the team came up with. But it's it has to be encouraged by a client. We all you know it's you got to have you know clients and. Uh, Kathleen has a great team at the NIK under, under her that push us to keep coming up with these ideas. But we probably present, you know, 20 of these ideas all, you know, at a time and like maybe we make one. So you gotta have some sort of perseverance of doing these things and be okay, have thick skin, no, that's a stupid idea. Because uh, Kathleen, as much praise as she gives, she will say, I fucking hate it. <laughs> And I will say I love it. Yeah, so you yeah, kind of sure. got to have or that. Or I'll say it doesn't suck. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Those are my range. So I think you just got to have that. And, and uh, that's the really important thing about not being precious with your ideas and having lots of them and being OK with things getting twisted and maybe pushed. And it pushes you into different areas. And that's just my approach. And I think Andy yeah. shares the same thing. And it's a big change for Microsoft, and I think that's why the people that are coming to work on it are seeing like, oh, this isn't like we're going to make one campaign a year and it's going to take, you know, a year to make. It's like, no, we might make something every week, and hopefully some of them will 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 really hit like the the girls' science thing did. But like, there may be some strikeouts, and you have to be okay with. I always want to go for the home runs, and when you go for the home run, you often strike out. That's okay because in the end, like what the world is, is sharing and loving are things that feel like home runs. Mm -hmm. This gets at uh, probably the most controversial or at least uh, conversation starting slide at Cannes last year was when RGA and Beats by Dre had literally had fuck briefs uh, in an, in a, as an entire slide. Put and, curses in there, always works. I and, just said uh, fuck. <laughs> They, uh, and, and the conversations that it started afterward were basically their point was that it shouldn't be about this long bureaucratic process of creating creative briefs, that it should be about a conversation and a relationship between the brand, in this case, of Beats by Dre and, and RGA are very connected at the hip. And, and you're getting on some of that. I'm going to guess you guys haven't reached quite that level of yeah, I throwing think out I, the creative. I briefs. actually disagree. I, I think that the beauty of a good brief is the direction and guidance that it gives you to have a higher batting average. So I don't think the briefing process should not be this automated, you know, bureaucratic back and forth. But if you don't know what you're aiming for and what the foundation of the story is, you're going to miss a lot. So I, I, I actually like super tight, super concise briefs, and I think Rob and the team does too. And then the process, though, of bringing the brief to life is a different process than it's been in the past. It's much more yeah. collaborative. Yeah. And we just came up. We had a four-hour meeting this morning, briefing for holiday. Um, and Sounds it's, it's well, it's more—it's more, it's more communicative. It's not yak yak yak. Here's some paper. See you later. Yeah. But I like I like having it. And yeah, as I far as Beats yeah. go, that's the guy who be, built the Beats brand. I don't know if you know this, but. They put Beats headphones, remember, in that college spot. Yeah, I, I, I think RGA did a good job in the Beats brand. I own way, Beats. Way, way long ago. I own Beats. Um, <laughs> now, I think Kathleen's right. I, I always say the brief is, to me, the best part of the creative process. And like, I spend most of the time on briefs, frankly. Um, and a bad one destroys the, the soul of, of creative people. And I say to clients, I mean, we all have had clients, the good ones and, and the challenging ones. And the challenging ones will always try to put a lot of things in that question or that, that statement you want, you know, that one statement. And I always say, like, listen, this brief is not for me or for Andy or for Kathleen. It's really for the young creative team, the 23, 24-year-old team that it's 4 in the morning and they've got to show work to Andy at, you know, at, at 10 in the morning the next day. Like, a really like concise like brief could be inspirational. Uh, it could be your best friend or it could be your, you know, your worst nightmare. So I would say that. And I explain that to clients and say, listen, that's, we want to go for a, a brief being the best friend of that young team who, in the end, will hopefully crack the thing you want cracked. Because yeah. it, it forces a discipline. The, the worst advertising comes out of trying to say the most things, I think. Yeah. And the discipline of the brief to get to a good one when they're good is narrowing down what you're trying to say. Yeah. And what you're trying to get as an outcome, like that's a, it's, you know, simplicity is a tough discipline. Sometimes <laughs> we say briefs on a T-shirt. You, can you? Yeah. You got to put the brief on a T-shirt. But each brief is a business objective, so that's why you have to have it. I mean, because you you have to have, you know, you have to have your goals. I mean, I think maybe for some things you don't need a brief, but ultimately, yeah, you need that you, know, you need that guidance and, the, and your reason and your goal that you're aiming for, and that's what the brief gives you. With Windows 10 and Edge on the way, uh, you're obviously phasing out two products that 
In the case of Internet Explorer, I'm sure everyone in the room was a big fan, really enjoyed it. Um, and, uh, and also getting past uh, some of the concerns with Windows 8, what are some of the unique challenges of acknowledging, the, the balancing that transparency of, okay, yeah, we admit this thing had some problems, but balancing it with maintaining a faith in the brand and an optimism in the brand. Uh, in the last few years, you guys have been much more transparent and uh, kind of honest about that. But what are some of the challenges that you're finding with walking that line? Um, I think, you know, when you, when you aim for transparency and honesty as your main mantra, it makes life a little bit easier. And as challenging as experience of the past might have been, it always gets better. So talking about the better part, like going to a website and being able to annotate on the website, send it to per somebody else with one button push, it's pretty friggin' amazing. So people forgive how bad something else might have been when they see how good something new is pretty quickly. So we really focus on that. And I think the, the very sort of human orientation of our engineering now is overcoming a previous hurdle where, like I said, we had great stuff. I don't know if you ever had somebody teach you something in Word or Excel and you go, holy crap, that's amazing. I never knew about that. There's a million of those because they were designed by engineers who are the only ones that know how to do that. But now it's, be, it's about being much more intuitive and simple so that people themselves can discover and they'll be of value. So you know, I think, I think that's really helping us going forward, keeping the humanity. I mean, the ability to touch your screen. I get crazy when these guys are on anybody or on production companies on set with a Mac and I keep going like this. I'm trying to enlarge things. I'm like, Jesus, give me a surface quick because you get so used to just intuitively, let me move this, let me make it bigger, let me, you know, and you can't. So I think with those as premises, it's, it's easy to lead people to the newer and better and forget about any pain of the past. From the research perspective where you guys are at now, especially with Tin, are you, uh, are you using social to kind of really listen to those conversations? You've talked about that with the, you know, really listening to the way that uh, Microsoft was uh, portrayed and was en envisioned uh, before. Uh, it, how are you using those tools now to kind of really listen to what people are saying about their concerns about 10, about what it could be, or whether their excitement for it, and building that in? I'm staring at you, so obviously I want you to answer oh, this. Oh, shit, me? No. Um, yeah, of course, you're, you, you know, you want to answer some of the fears for people. In the, the, uh, People are afraid if they move to a different operating system or an upgrade, they're going to lose all their stuff. So we're addressing all those things, and how do you bake that into the marketing is, you know, you listen to people. But certainly Microsoft, I mean, they aren't listening for, you know, comments from the ad agency that has been watching to how they're addressing the software. I mean, all that's sort of figured out. So we look at it and say, okay, here's why. This is a great thing. It's an amazing product. One of the big things is people... Once you try a Microsoft product, like, oh, this is great. It's getting the people to try. So how do you move people from, yeah, listen, it sounds like certainly this group, right? Everybody's a Mac person. It's much, uh, you know, I always say to creative people, if we can convince the people that are sitting in this audience to, to move to Microsoft, you know, you've done your job because this is the hardest group to get done. So the things you're listening to in social is um, more about what are the fears people have about upgrading because that's the real key. You know, it's free. It's an amazing thing. It's like all you got to do is just say, yes, I want to upgrade. The process you know, could be challenging depending on different devices. So we're always figuring out ways like how can you bake that into marketing? And we've used it a, a decent amount, but Microsoft's really good at, at listening and, and doing a lot of the heavy, so we can Yeah, there's no that. more vocal, I don't think, constituent base out there than our users. And there's tons of technology in place for the feedback. You, you probably get asked all the time, do you want to send feedback back to Microsoft? Yes. Yeah. So you know, like, like the premise of some of the I'm a PC stuff, there's, a billion people out there who will tell us what they think if we just turn on the microphone and we do a lot. And these guys use you know, the truth central technology, which is basically listening to sentiment and distilling it, is a helpful external perspective. So we know a lot about what people who use the product or begin to use beta versions of products think and feel. And then these guys really help us with, yeah, here's what the other people think and feel, and you got to balance that. It's, it's good perspective. Well, I think also with 10, if I can add, because I think it's really critical and it does lead to the social idea, is that it's the first time ever the, an OS, the major OS, like the biggest one in the world, was wide open to anyone who wanted to download it in the beta form and then respond back. Right, yep. so you were listening to developers, but also you know consumer end users and, and filmmakers and anyone who did, anyone who wanted to just sign up and download it. It's like a crowdsource. OS so you're, you're, it kind of is, and that yep. was uh, that was remarkable. So there was a lot of listening that, that Microsoft then uh, took all of that and actually are still from adding and tweaking based on the comments that are still coming in. From what mm -hmm. I understand. Yep. So. How would you, Kathleen? How would you describe the 
kind of unique challenge of, uh, the, of Windows 10 and of the marketing uh, mission for that. Uh, it seems like for a lot of people that Windows is Microsoft, that, that is, it is the, the heart and soul of mm -hmm. Microsoft. Does that put a lot of pressure on you and on your team when you think about uh, the success of Windows 10? It seems like every era of Microsoft is defined by the success of that era's uh, I, that I have a heart era. attack before every release. <laughs> I, I, I have Ajita. I had it before 7. I had it before 8. I'll have it before 10. It's, it's, it's intensely you know, pressure-filled to wait to see how people are going to receive and react to the product and then how the marketing accordingly has to react. Um, but. You know, we've been succeeding. So I guess maybe I'm a little less nervous over time, but always a nervous mother. It's like giving birth again. Shit, scary, but oh, I did it already. It worked. So <laughs> that's where I am now on I 10. Have, I have I'm not. Not, I'm not too worried. Yeah, <laughs> something you can't say. Yeah, that's true. Well, Microsoft's working on that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Andy, any thoughts on, uh, on the challenges of, with Windows 10 about kind of how, what you see will be, what, what will make for a really successful campaign for 10? Uh, if the entire world downloads it. <laughs> a billion people <laughs> download it. 99% not month, enough. If we yeah. can get a billion downloads, I think we're doing really well. I, I, it's interesting because I, I keep watching. What's happening right now as Windows 10 is developing and the marketing is about to go live is at the same time Microsoft is doing, is, uh, is this like this, uh, it's like a press junket, but it's all like, oh my, it's all tech, uh, um, massive, massive, um, uh, arena filled uh, events that are happening, right? So I keep watching the keynotes of that and it's just, it's, it's hard not to believe this is gonna be incredibly successful on its own. I hate to say it, even without any marketing, uh, it should work. I mean, everything you're looking at and how it's happening, how it's working, how it's, uh, how it's evolving, uh, it's like, you know, knock on wood, it's, how can this fail? It's going to be really yeah. great because it's fixing so many issues and it's actually making people who, um, who didn't uh, leave seven to go to eight, you know, it's almost a no-brainer for them, but then also for eight, it's everything that they need and then it's also a great time for anyone who hasn't jumped in yet to the, to the OS at all to come in now. So it's, uh, it's kind of this, uh, it's a perfect alignment of all these things coming together and, uh, and the marketing should then basically just uh, deliver the news in such a way that's so appealing to say, this is, this is our time, this is a really great time to do it in, in a real positive way. I, yeah, I, think, I look at yeah. success differently. You know, people come to interview with me, and it's usually more of the senior people, and they say, what do you think my job is, whether they're coming to work for Microsoft um, or a different uh, global client. I say, you have one job, and that job is to take care of your family, right? And you hope you get to do it with people you really like and whether it's clients or coworkers, and you do work that you're really proud of. Like, that's your job, is take care of your family. And it's just as hard to do average bad work as it is to do great work, so why not go for great work? So I think at the end of this, hopefully we will make a great campaign and it has lots of different touch points and that are fun and it's interesting, but the process together is a good one. So far it's been good. We're gonna go into the production part of it, which is always, the most challenging and people cry. Um, but in the end, like we can walk away that like we like each other and we want to do the next thing that comes up. And you've got a relationship and I've worked with Kathleen a long time and there's been many fights, but like uh, there's also been, you know, I was a lot. Uh, what? Yeah. <laughs> so that's how I view success. And I think that's hopefully how, you know, most, you know, people that run companies like myself view success. In the end, if the relationship still isn't good at the end of the process, well, then, then you failed. But I think your question is an interesting one that <laughs> agencies and clients should talk to each other about. We tell these guys what we're worried about, what, what scares us, what fears we have. Like, the, and I said it before, it goes back to honesty. Like, I'm scared shitless after that meeting, X, Y, Z. And he'll go, yeah, I agree with you, or no, here's why you don't have to be. So being open to those kinds of, you know, holy crap conversations without it being something negative or precious, like, oh, does that mean you didn't like the work? It's not, a, it's not about the work, it's what we're trying to accomplish. And, you know, we've been lucky that we have teams that you can actually share real fears with, honestly and directly, and then they figure out how to solve the problem for you. That's what, you know, it's really yeah. about. It's getting all warm and fuzzy up here. Yeah. I know, we never kiss, though. We never hug, That's we never... Good.
Well, let's see if we can break that up. We're going to know gonna, what my yeah. birthday is. None of that. <laughs> We're going to open up some questions to the audience. You should, uh, by the way. I believe there are some mic handlers around. Mic handlers, can you wave so I know where you are? OK, good. Somebody um, has so a question. If anyone has a question for our panel, please raise your hand, and they'll bring around the mic to you. I know you. Be provocative. Somebody asked a question. Come on. Right here. Guy in a good hat. <laughs> oh, yeah. <Okay>. Holloway. <laughs> it's your question now. Ask a question. They're right there. Right I've got a gentleman, brave gentleman. Well, I'm not the brave guy, as you are. Oh. Uh, I just wanted to ask you guys, um, this has been uh, in my head, and it's kind of a complicated question in two ways. Uh, what do you do as an agency when you sit and you have a brief? You know the aim, end goal is pretty big. You have to break it down to a small one. How do you see the success? What is your small time goal? And how do you start cracking on it? Okay. Like, what is your first step that you do? After great, you get the brief? great question. Uh, I have a process that Andy process. agrees with. Um, <laughs> when you get a brief that you, you land on, you, uh, the first round of work I, we always look at is like, what's the story the press will write about when this idea lands in culture? And it was really devised to help younger people compete with old, older teams. It's really hard to say what's the new campaign for Windows 10, especially now where it's like, you gotta come up with what's the broadcast, what's the films, what's the social. It's really hard to make that presentation. It's much easier to say, okay, here's a story the New York Times will write in this idea, idea lands and culture. And you start there, and then anybody can come up with what that press release is. And it, yeah, you might, we, it's easy for us to look at 50 in, in an hour versus like everybody really going away for three weeks and working on a campaign. So we end up sharing those sort of press releasey sort of ideas with Kathleen and her team early on. And then you say, hey, and, you know, Kathleen has done this enough that, that that's something and uh, that's not something. So that's, that's pretty much, and that's sort of a thing that I think every agency has their version of that. And uh, I took it from the last place. That was, that's, I helped make it, so. It was great. <laughs> I had never done that before. Um, my process before was to like, uh, just make sure everyone, uh, you know, before they came up with the idea, like I go spend an extra day trying to understand the problem before you come up with the answers, because I don't want to see answers that you don't really even know what the problem is. So, but what I really love about this, and we've been, we, it's been from day one, is that it really does um, shortcut the whole process and get you in highly focused into, you know, ultimately what we're trying to do, which is really great work, and really great work is what the press is going to write about. So why not say, well, let's just write, let's just write that. Let's start there. Let's, let's write what the what the press just said about your idea. Uh, before we've even done a thing, and it's been really great. Right, and to be clear, it's not press about the marketing, it's press about the impact of the marketing. So it's not about yeah. headline, that was great creative, it's headline, Microsoft XYZ. So it's about you know the accomplishment. I think it's a great exercise, because it really hones in on, God, what do we really want this outcome uh, to be? Like, what does success look like? Not when you do like measurement success, but And in the end, you want sentiment. younger people to just be successful. Like I always want the, 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 the more junior the team, the, the, I want to give them the best chance to be successful. So always come up with all these tools. It ends up being the best thing in the end for the, the marketing because the younger people are really the people are, in the end we're trying to convince to you know, embrace Microsoft. And it's, and it's interesting, I think, certainly as someone who's uh, Andy in our age, we grew up in this Mac, Mac, Mac world, but like you talk to teenagers now, they just have such a, um, they're not loyal to any brand. You know, they may have an Android phone, they might use a PC, or they might use a Surface tablet, and they also have an Xbox, or they have a PlayStation, so they're not loyal to this thing. So it's a new world we're living in, and that's the part that makes it interesting. It's like, you know, how do we get the young people to believe in Microsoft? And a lot of them do, but a lot more need to. Well, as a follow-up to that, too, as the next step, really, when you're talking about the creative development, it used to be that you kind of started uh, with the idea for the TV anthem spot, the one-minute spot, back when that was a long time. And now, what is, what is that hub of the creative concept that proves uh, the idea? Is it the long-form YouTube video? Is it uh, you know, the social content plan? What, what is the hub of the creative concept now? It's kind of all. I mean, these guys generally give us you know, that, what's that headline we're trying to create in the marketplace? Here's sort of, you know, an anthemic kind of representation of that in a video form, so you get a feel for the idea. 
And then here's sort of test case concepts from you know, TV to social on that. Because you really can't judge any idea just by TV anymore. You just can't. It might make a great TV commercial, but it's got no legs across anything else. And you know, these guys, you kind of have to bring in the gamut of the work. And they do generally, not, not broadly, but like, you know, at least here's the idea. Here's how it executes across channels to judge it. Yeah, I mean, but it's also a global thing. It's much harder than yep. doing yep. Jack in the Box or Burger King or anything that feels kind of local, at least to the US. I mean, you have to really think about all these countries and the nuances. Of, so we have actually a lot of teams from around the world. They actually sit in New York, and we have teams that are out in the world. But it's, it's a hornet's nest. I mean, it's not that easy to do. But I think if you start with what that idea is, and then you can articulate it in a pretty decent way. But like, you got to think of those countries that don't have any media or any media channels. They might have just social. They might just have a, a small radio by. Does the idea even work in those small countries? So you don't do it for the big ones. You do it like, does this idea at least resonate and have some power in the places that don't have the money? Any other questions from our audience? We've got a few more minutes. Question? Right in the yes, middle. Got one right in the middle. The microphone's coming your way. Yes. Um, thank you again for taking the time to uh, speak with us all. Very sweet. Um, I feel like I'm hearing a lot of conversation comparison, comparing Microsoft to Apple. And when I think of Microsoft, maybe I'm just of a generation. It's like when I close my eyes, I think of the first time I ever used a computer. And your brand comes to mind. And I feel like that's such a strong connection. And mm -hmm. I'm curious if there's any equity in there, like to be explored there. Because I just, I'm constantly feeling like this comparison. Yes, because you're talking to battle scarred veterans here, that's why. And, and but when I think of, like, I think of the, the, when I think of Microsoft, I think of my youth and I think of the first, you know, Your discovery. Yeah. Use the internet. I yeah. So that's. Do you work for us? We, no. <laughs> it's Another plan. I have a friend who does. You, you represent what we found out when we went out to do that, our initial brand research around Windows and Microsoft. And I was worried. Like, I thought there'd be more excitement in some of this qualitative stuff around pantyhose than there was about an OS. It blew my mind the degree of emotion that there is. Like you said, it was my entree to the world in some ways. Like, in, in China and Brazil, like, in, in Brazil, we get quotes like, Microsoft is like a mother to me. It was nurturing and empowerment. And you're like, holy mackerel, how rich is that? And we do sometimes get too US, too past focused in our um, you know, conversation. But that richness is what informs the work that we do. And it was, it, some of the visuals, we had people do collages where you know, they were climbing a mountain. And, and, and Microsoft was that strong foundation that enabled them to achieve their goal, which is reaching the top. Or a woman holding a box of butterflies that she was setting free, because it was all about empowerment and releasing my hopes and dreams. <laughs> and you're like, oh my gosh, it's amazing stuff. So thank we you, don't have because that, we, don't have we forget that sometimes. But, but that is what we, aside from the conversations we're having, which is kind of the history of the evolution, yeah. where we are now is all about focusing on that. Look, we, we, we make your dreams come true. We help you be all the possibility that you can be by just letting you get to it and getting out of the way. And that's the goal. You know, I think the Gleason spot kind of represents that, and the whole Empowering Us All campaign represents that. So thanks. That's a great we'll question. We'll remember that. We have time for one more question if we hustle. So anybody have anything else? Pass the mic behind you. Last one. Miss with a great question. Um, this is a question really for, well, for Rob and Andy, but then probably Kathleen can chime in. Um, it seems that you guys involve the client very early on in the creative process, like at the very, very beginnings of the creative process. Yeah. And that's to me a really scary time for, particularly for clients because it's, everything is very amorphous and there's nothing, nothing solid yet. There's no, no comps to see or, or anything like that. How do you nurture the client through that and make them feel that this is still kind of early days, but it's. Some clients, you know, right away, but I mean, I think it's just working together for a long time. You get a uh, familiarity with something and, and uh, a process that is good. It doesn't work all the time, but I, my, I always say avoid the ta-da. I mean, I think the biggest worry is that, and especially when you're dealing with like companies that are spending lots of money and they've sort of got a real role in people's lives that's meaningful, like it is important kind of the things you're making and the communications you're making. So get some feedback early in the end like as Kathleen said she does not want to write the ads and um, so 
she's just gonna give us feedback and it's up to us to go back and then take some of that feedback and turn it into the things we wanna make. I don't know, if you go away but, for a long time, you might not end up in the right And one place. commitment that we have, sorry, jump in if you wanna jump in any, but is we don't let, we only let the right people in the room with these guys. Like, there are certain people who would kill a nascent idea because they don't quite understand it. So we're very rigorous about how tight, which is I think key to success this process is, and who gets to hear early ideas and weigh in. And it's two people. I mean, it's not a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, so that, I think that, that helps. Exactly Wind right. it up, Andy. It would, <laughs> be good, be good. It's, it's a great question because it, it doesn't you. work very often. And, and it takes time. And if Rob hadn't had the relationship with you earlier, and if I hadn't maybe had some history way, way back when, we, we may not have been able to do it right away with, with, uh, with Kathleen, but because you guys already had established this rhythm and this, this belief that if I can, I can show you this, this concept of, which is just a piece of, just some words on paper, and you have enough faith that it, within the next few months that's gonna develop into some brilliant work, it works. But it, yeah, this would not work for like nine out of our other clients, like other places, but yeah, it does work well. Well, please join me in thanking our panel for coming out today, and thank you all for coming out.